second. Finally, I know that Mr. Schwarzenegger is bursting to speak with you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Eva and Gideon, Wayne, Jim Lorimer, Bob Lorimer, Raphael, and everyone. Uh, you know, I had a big vision when I was 20 years old and I won my first Mr. Universe contest. And that was to promote bodybuilding and fitness all over the world. And that was the beginning of a fitness crusade. And uh, we were very successful by organizing bodybuilding championships, including the Arnold Classic in Columbus, Ohio. And the Arnold Classic in Columbus, Ohio became the biggest and the most important bodybuilding competition and eventually the biggest and most important sports and fitness festival. We had over 1,200 different companies displaying their goods there. We had convention centers that we kind of grew out of and we occupied over 160 hotels. We had over 200,000 people coming and watch the competitions. We had uh, 20,000 athletes participating in 58 different sports and orders. So it grew so fast that we decided to go and have the Arnold Classic in all six continents. And so naturally, one of the most important continents is Africa. So we are so excited about now having the fifth out of six Arnold Classics right here in Africa, specifically in South Africa. I have been coming here to South Africa since 1967 because my idol lived here. The man that actually inspired me to get into weightlifting and into bodybuilding and into fitness. His name was Reg Park. And as a matter of fact, his son and his daughter, Chan Chan Park and Chines Park are sitting right there. Why don't you get up for a second? So I kind of grew up with them when they were little kids. I came here in 1967 to train with Reg Park with my idol and to do exhibitions here and seminars and stuff like that. And, um, you know, the sport since then grew tremendously. So this is why it is so great for me to be back here. Also, I won, as you've said earlier, Eva, that I won the Mr. Olympia competition here in 1975. And I have to tell you that no matter what they write or say, we were the first sports competition where we insisted, where the IFBB, the International Federation of Bodybuilding, insisted to have mixed audience, blacks, whites, Indians, and everyone in the same auditorium, and also on a stage. The competitors, there was no restrictions at all. There was our condition to the government in order to bring our competition here to South Africa. And so now to be back where apartheid is over and where South Africa has moved forward in such a big way. And I'm reminded that one of my idols is Mandela. And, um, you know, he was one of those extraordinary leaders and one, he's always one of the five people that I mention as my, as, uh, my idols. Uh, so it's great to be here in South Africa and to work with such extraordinary leadership as Wayne is providing here. And to put on this competition, as you've heard, 48 different sports that we have participating. We have almost 11,000 athletes. Just to give you an idea, the Olympics have around 10,000 athletes. So just think about how big we are with this competition. This is the first time that we have held it here. So, I mean, this is going to be exploding. This is going to be huge. And when I talk about the sports and fitness uh, crusade, what I'm talking about is, is that we are not reaching out only to those and celebrating those that win. We celebrate anyone that participates. The Arnold Classic Sports and, Fist of, uh, Festival, Sports and Fitness Festival is all about participation. The families train together. The kids train. Women train, men train, young train, old train. Everyone ought to participate. That's what we are celebrating here at the Arnold Classic. And this is why I think the South African government was so interested in partnering with us, because they want to promote health and fitness 
here in South Africa. And this is what we want to promote all over the continent and what we want to promote all over the world. So I want to say thank you to everyone here that has been participating and that I want to say thank you to the press because without the press we never would get the information out as efficiently. Friends from the media have been asked to give us questions. We've uh, got it down to 10. There were about 73,000 of them for Mr. Schwarzenegger, but we've narrowed it down to 10. So the first one comes from Clinton van der Berg from Supersport. He talks about the fact that you competed here in the 70s and you were inspired by Reg Park, which we know by now. What are your memories of that time, both in South Africa and of the bodybuilding culture in general at that time? Well, first of all, I remember that the competition was in Pretoria. And it was without any doubt one of the most beautiful cities that I have been. Um, also, I saw that the bodybuilding sport was growing very fast here in South Africa, especially because they had a great idol here, Reg Park, who had a gymnasium, uh, and had several gymnasiums, but the one that I worked out in always was on 42 Kirk Street. And I remember that uh, I, as uh, a 19-year-old kid, was very heavily into sleeping late at night, uh, in the morning. But Reg was not into that at all. And I remember that at 4.45, he woke me up. I just arrived from Munich. Uh, and he woke me up and he says, ready to work out. And I said, I guess so. <laughs> and so he gave me some oatmeal and some cereal. And uh, then we drove off to the gym and did, uh, 5.15, we were already squatting with 400 pounds and uh, we're going all out in our workouts. I remember those days. So, I mean, it was, uh, you know, I, I think he was just such a hero to so many. And this is why I also want to mention that we are handing out an award, which is uh, the first time ever, the Reg Park Award. And this will go to the most muscular man uh, in the world, the, the person that will win on Saturday night, we'll get that award right along with the Arnold Classic trophy. And uh, because it's very important that we continue remembering where the sport came from and what I do basically is promoting it and I'm standing on the shoulders of great heroic people that have been before me. And Reg Park and John Grimmick and Eugene Sandow and people like that were definitely some of those great, great men that inspired millions, and let's not forget Reg Park has also done many Hercules movies, and that was seen by millions. They maybe have not seen him on stage winning the Mr. Universe, but they've seen his movies, and that was one of those that also made me then want not only to be a bodybuilding champion, but an actor and get into movies. So he was a great inspiration to millions. Clinton, if you'll just put up your hand, because there's a second question here from Clinton. You've had an extraordinary life in bodybuilding, he says, politics and filmmaking. What are the disciplines and the lessons you learned from each of these along the way to becoming as successful as what you have become? Well, I think that I, I talk a lot about uh, the whole idea of success. And, um, you know, there's certain rules that you have to apply. And I do seminars and speeches about this all over the world. Uh, so I'm not going to bore you with the, with the two-hour speech, but I think can tell you one of the most important things is that you have a clear vision. I always was a believer that if you don't have a vision, you cannot succeed in anything. And um, because otherwise you just drift around. And I feel bad and sorry for people that don't have a vision. I mean, if you think about the latest study in the United States uh, showed that 70% of the people are not happy with their work. So, I mean, imagine how that sucks, that you spend the, last, the entire life working on something that you don't like. I mean, that's only because you got into that job because you just needed money and you need to make a living, you have a family and you have your orders. So, I think that the way to go is, is to have a very clear vision, to spend the time and the energy on just thinking about it. What is it that you want to do? Not what your parents want you to do, not what your coach wants you to do, not what your friends want you to do. What is it that you want to do? What is it that you are passionate about? And so that's the key thing. I mean, you can have the best ship in the world, but if you don't have a captain that knows where he's going, that ship will be drifting around and it will end up somewhere where it doesn't want to be. And the same is with the most sophisticated airplane in the world. If the pilot doesn't know where to go, you're not going to go anywhere. And so I am a big believer in vision. 
Then the other thing is, of course, you get the, when you have a big vision, what do you hear most likely? Oh, come on, you're crazy. This will never happen. You can't do that. That's impossible. No one has done it. And I believe what Mandela said, that, that you know, everything is always impossible until someone does it. And so I, that has never held me back from not doing something because no one else has done it. So uh, never listen to the naysayers. Never listen to the people that say it's impossible, it can't be done, or you know, it won't happen and all this stuff. I always heard, yes, it can be done. I remember when I was uh, uh, running for governor. They said, that's impossible. People have to start small. They have to run first for mayor or for city council. I said, I don't have time for this little stuff. I said, I, said, I want to get right away to the bottom line. The highest office I can run by not being born in the United States is running for governor. That's, that's what I'm going to do. And you know, two months later, I was governor. So I didn't listen to the naysayers. And the same was also when I went in the movies to say the guy with an Austrian accent and with a name like Schwarzenegger that no one can pronounce, you're never going to go and become a leading man. And um, they said you were too big, too muscular. And um, you know, now the end thing is, Dustin Hoffman, he weighs 150 pounds. It's the 70s. You know, they say the same thing is like Al Pacino, he weighs 150 pounds. He's a little guy. Woody Allen, now that's a sex symbol. No, but, but, uh, but Arnold, you're way too big. I mean, this is not going to work out. Forget it. But I didn't listen to the naysayers, and I became the highest paid actor in the history of motion pictures. So don't listen to the naysayers. And then there's one third one that I want to mention. Actually, two one two more I want to mention. One is work your ass off. Don't wait for a short uh, cuts. Uh, don't uh, concentrate on how can you cheat or get around the rules and all those kind of things. You got to work your butt off. That's the bottom line. Work, work, work. You know, there's 24 hours a day. You sleep six hours, then you have 18 hours left to go and move forward in life. A lot of people waste their time. There's some people who think that they need to sleep more than six hours. Just sleep faster. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but the, the bottom line is, is you know, you sleep and then you have 18 hours left. 10 hours you work, maybe an hour or two for traveling around to get to your workplace, but then you still have hours left to learn something, to educate yourself, to work out, improve your body, improve your mind, and all of those things. So, so those are things. And then the, the, one of the most important I want to mention is don't just think about yourself. It's not just about me. Make me into we. That's the important thing. We got to go and give back because in the end we're not going to be judged by how much we make, but by how much we give. You got to always think about giving back, giving back. What do you do for your community? What do you do for your country? Remember what Kennedy said, you know, don't think about just what government can do for you. Think about what you can do for your government, for your country. And this is what, what I'm talking about. Give something back to your country. And then if you do that, I think if you apply those rules, it's going to help you to be more successful. All right? Alistair Anderson from Business Days. Alistair here. Alistair in the front right-hand side wants to know, do you feel that bodybuilding perhaps needs a resurgence globally? And how does it compete with outdoor sports which are growing right now? There is no one, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Mr. President, there is nothing in our constitution that says that we cannot train outside. Am I correct? 100% correct, so good. I'm happy about that because I have always on uh, Venice Beach and on Muscle Beach worked out outside half of the time and inside in Gold's Gym half of the time. So now when I work out at home, I work out many times outside, so there's no reason that you cannot go and take a run on the beach or just run around and do uh, running outside and do your push-ups outside, do your sit-ups outside and all those things. So you don't have to restrict yourself to just uh, the inside. Ten years ago, we were like 120 countries. Now, 191 countries are regularly participating and hoarding their competitions, local competitions, state competitions, national competitions. So the growth is unbelievable. So we are very happy with the growth, but we are never 100% happy because we want to make it faster growing and we want everyone to participate. And the other thing that is interesting is in Raphael and I, we talked about it, is that it is amazing that now you can go literally to any hotel in the world 
and you will f see a fitness gym in a hotel. Now I can tell you that 20 years ago when I traveled around the world, it was almost impossible to find a hotel with a gym. So it just shows to you that now they have in every military uh, base, every police station, every fire station, every university, every sports team, everyone is now working out, even in hospitals. They have the therapy centers after surgery where you do weight resistance training and so on. So this has really become like an activity that uh, everyone can do. And now we just have to you know, take on the challenge that you were mentioning, that there's still a large percentage of people that are couch potatoes. A couch potato is someone that sits on the couch and watches TV or listens to the radio, listens to some music, but doesn't get up and go out and do something. So this is what the fitness festival, the sports and fitness festival is all about, is to encourage people and to bring them in and to see the joy of being healthy and fit and to participate. Uh, Arnold, why do you think the Arnold Classic has been such a global success? I think that uh, because the reason why it has been such a success is because we always have been inclusive. So that uh, if there is a sport that wanted to participate, I remember when uh, the boxers came in Columbus and they said, can we participate? I said, of course, you're a great sport. We love watching boxing on television. If it's amateur sport, uh, as boxing, if it's for kids, the boxing, I said, yes, bring them in as long as you are concentrating on the youth and on the grown-ups, not just on the grown-ups. You want to see that, they, that from young on, you can do that sport. So they became part of it, and now we have boxing there, and the same is with all of the different martial arts styles. And so, so everyone was always included. We are very inclusive and bring sports in and invite them in, uh, and uh, this is why the Arnold Classic Sports and Fitness Festival has grown so fast in the United States and became kind of a model for the rest of the world, for all the other continents. We use that same model. We bring in the local team from Ohio to help the local leaders and the organizers, and uh, therefore our competitions the first time around are already highly successful, as you can see here with the participation and with the level of entries of uh, participants that we have. I mean, just today I was having breakfast, and I was so lucky that I came early, because there were the world's strongest men cleaning up that breakfast table, I tell you. <laughs> oh, I, I saw when I walked in there, there was still food left, and by the time I was gone, it was all gone. You know, and the, the manager of the, of the restaurant had to quickly get the food out of the kitchen. So it was very really funny to watch the world's strongest man here. They're, they're like the 10 of the biggest and strongest guys, you know, just the eating, the, forget the competition, the competition is also highly entertaining, like you say, <laughs> sports are always very entertaining, but just to watch them eat, so, but I mean, we, we have a great time, and we have everyone participate, and this is, and we have a great organization, um, I tell you, Jim Lorimer, the guy that just talked earlier, he's probably the most organized person that I've ever met, and, um, with his organizational skills and with all of the great committees that we've put together. We have like thousands of people volunteering and working for us. And the same is here also, you know, with a combination of government, the public sector, the private sector, the nonprofit sector, the volunteers and everyone coming together. You can have a really successful event. And uh, so we have a great formula and we're very happy about that. Arnold, lastly, if I asked you to take a step back from your life and imagine that 15-year-old lad who first saw Reg Park in, in the movie Hercules from a small place in Tal, we had to go and fetch water outside in the freezing cold to what your life is today. Aren't you sometimes amazed at what's happened to you in your years when you take a step back? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's like you just always hope that it isn't just a dream and all of a sudden, you know, Someone comes to you and like goes like this and says, hey, Arnold, wake up. You got to go to the factory now to work. Come on now, stop dreaming. <laughs> I hope that doesn't happen. <laughs> no, it is, like, it's, it is like a dream. And um, I have to say that I was very fortunate because America is without any doubt the land of opportunity. I went there with absolutely nothing and uh, I was full of dreams and full of hope and I had that fire in the belly but I had absolutely nothing. I went over there 
and I was embraced with open arms, and I was given all the opportunities. Uh, so uh, without America, I would not have been able to make it. And without having all the mentors and the coaches and the training partners and people that believed in me, I would not have been able to make it. And the reason why I'm mentioning that is because so many times people talk about he's a self-made man. Well, let me tell you something. There is no such a thing as a self-made man. We never make ourselves. The amount of work that it takes for our parents to just educate you, for our teachers, for our coaches to coach you and to train you. By the time you get to be just 20, when you're just about ready to go out in the world, the amount of people that worked on you and helped you, you're never a self-made man. It doesn't exist. And then later on, you need continuous help. If I wouldn't have had Joe Weider taking me over to America and giving me the opportunity, I wouldn't have done those things. So it's on and on and on. There is no such thing. We all need help, and you better appreciate the help that you get around you. Thank you. Shall we give Arnold another big warm round of applause, please? Thank you one more time, everybody. And again, I urge you, if you haven't been across the footbridge yet, please go to our top table. Thank you so much.